Hello, my name is Meredith Kutz, a professional development associate here at NACE. I'd like to welcome you to today's event, Town Hall, Leading Practices for Virtual Career Fairs and Recruiting Events. Today's session is being sponsored by Premier Virtual. It is my pleasure to introduce Stephen Edwards, who will tell you more about Premier Virtual. Hi, my name is Steve Edwards, the CEO of Premier Virtual, and we are a proud sponsor today uh, for the next presentation to go over uh, virtual career fairs. A little bit about our platform is we're a veteran owned business. I was in the 82nd Airborne Division. 40% of my staff are also military veterans. And I come from nine years of putting on in-person job fairs. Two years ago, I saw a big change in the market. So I created uh, the virtual platform. Some of you on this call use our platform. Some of you we have talked to uh, that's out there. And it's one thing that you can always see about our platform is it's easy, it's robust. No matter which platform that's out there, when you peel back the onions of, of everything that's gonna be, it's connecting a student with the business. So how does it get there? We make it as easy as possible to be able to have that. Uh, from the time you set up your event, your, your virtual environment is up and running within 24 hours, and you can start setting up your event so that you can start marking it. We have live support staff during all of your events, training, we do training, we do Instagram live with your students if you want to as well. We all know the challenges that happened. COVID changed the industry completely with going from in-person career fairs to virtual career fairs. Um, you know, so we have virtual career fairs, we have organizations that do meet the firms for their accounting, virtual nursing job fairs. So you can now take your school can now get companies that normally wouldn't have came to your in person events, but they can now attend your virtual career fairs. You can customize your lobby. This is one of our clients that customize it based on major. So when that student is logging in, they can come in, see the companies that are just hiring based on their major industry, anything that they're looking for. You can brand and customize your registration page with videos. This is one of the meet the firms nights where they had it and they can put their sponsors on there. So you can monetize that as well. Again, putting all of your companies that are on there, um, having one list of just your sponsors. So there's a lot that you can do, create videos um, for your organizations. Your virtual booths, you want to be able to get that information directly so the students can see what type, what the organization does, what type of jobs they're hiring for, and be able to research these. So these students don't have to wait in long lines. They can chat directly with those candidates. They can do video chat as well. Um, so that it makes it very efficient. Each company has a virtual hiring room that they're gonna be able to chat as well as video. They can talk to multiple candidates at one time, all in private one-on-one -on -one, um, companies. They all have a dashboard, so they get reports. And then you as a host, you get the reports of everything afterwards as well. So you're gonna know how many candidates logged into each booth, how many chats happen. You get all of the reports that you need. Costs go down, attendance goes up, my name is Steve Edwards, again, the CEO of Premier Virtual, and we appreciate your time today of looking at this, and good luck in the seminar. And I want to pass it back over to Sean now. Now it is my pleasure to introduce NACE Executive Director, Sean Vanderzeel. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's session. Thank you so much, Steve and uh, Premier Virtual. We really appreciate your support of today's event. Without your support, today's event wouldn't be possible. So it really does uh, mean a lot to us in the profession to have that support. We are gonna dive deep today into the topic of uh, virtual career fairs and online virtual events. We've spent the last few town halls talking about just the fall and all the activity and all the newness. And we thought we'd do a deep dive today on specifically virtual events uh, because there's a lot of innovation happening out there. There are many things that didn't work that we know we don't want to do anymore. Uh, there are things that are evolving that we really want to test out further because they're proving to be really successful. And I'll tell you, we had a pre-call with all of our panelists today and they have some really interesting uh, information to share with you about their experiences. And so I'm really excited to introduce you to them. 
and I'm gonna have them introduce themselves to you because uh, I, I love to have them do it in their own words. So uh, each panelist, when I uh, uh, call you up, if you could uh, just tell us who you are, uh, what your position is, where you're dialing in from, so we know geography where you are and tell us a little bit about your company so we know what perspective you're coming from. So why don't we start with Lynn? Hi, Lynn. Hi, Sean. The dreaded unmute, right? <laughs> so hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for, for having, having me and having us get to talk about UD and also learn from um, our colleagues here. So my name is Lynn Epps. I'm the Senior Associate Director for Employer and Alumni Engagement with the University of Delaware Career Center. I've been at the university for nine and a half years. Prior to coming to UD, I have a background in diversity focused talent acquisition and recruiting and also done some work in nonprofit and in some other higher ed institutions. And um, UD, University of Delaware, better known as UD, uh, we have enrollment of about 23,000, a little over 23,000 undergraduate and graduate students. We have nine colleges and we're considered a major research university. Um, our career center, we have essentially, we have a campus career center, which services seven of the nine colleges. We have a learner college of business career center, and then also a career center team for the graduate college. And we work very, very closely together in support of our students and alumni and employers at campus community. And we also have a couple of notable alumni that you may have heard of recently. <laughs> Awesome. They happen to, uh, to be entering into a very high C-suite position in yeah. our country, right? Some okay. have said. Some have said. <laughs> All right. Uh, Etienne. Absolutely. So, Sean, and thank you so much for having me here. Um, my name is Etienne Vasquez, and I serve as the head of entry-level recruitment for the Americas region at Bloomberg. So for those who are not familiar with Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg is a FinTech company uh, that focuses on providing financial data and software to the financial community. Uh, but it certainly extends beyond that. It extends to uh, universities, corporations, uh, and a number of other different verticals uh, and, and professions. So I've been at Bloomberg now for nine years and I actually started my career on the business side. So I worked for eight years, both in our analytics business, which is our client services or customer focused business, uh, where I managed for six out of the seven and a half years I was there, uh, and then moved over to our sales division, where I focused as a communications workflow specialist, uh, bridging the gap between our product teams, sales teams, and our clients. Um, while I was in both of those businesses, I did a lot of recruitment, uh, and I loved it, and, and just so happened to work out that I was able to take some of that leadership experience I had and transition this past year uh, into a role leading our, our regional entry recruitment efforts. So uh, it's been a blast. And, and as I said on the prep call, and I'll say it again, it's been a great, uh, great year uh, to transition into a role like this. Uh, I've learned quite a bit um, in this virtual environment. Excellent. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, well, let's go with Sue. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sue Schmitz, and I am the Student Life and Career Development Director at Hennepin Technical College, and that is in Brooklyn Park and Eden Prairie, Minnesota. And we're right uh, in the first ring suburbs right outside of Minneapolis. And just a little bit about my institution. We have about 5,000 students. About 75% of the students are, are part-time. 65% of our students come from underrepresented populations. And most of them work full-time and have families. And the average age of our student is 28 years old. So welcome, everybody. Great overview. Thank you. And Jasmine. Hi, everyone, and good afternoon and good morning, wherever you are in the world. I am in Philadelphia, PA. I'm here to represent CSL Bearing. We are a 100-year-old biotech organization. I'm globally based in Melbourne, Australia, but domestically in King of Prussia, PA. Um, we specialize in rare blood disorders and also rare disease. Um, specifically, I'd love to highlight that for those of you who don't know, we are the second largest producer in the world of the influenza vaccine. So. As I like to say to people, it's go time for us. Um, we also have a mindset of keeping our patients first. I, do, I lead global university relations for the US and EMEA, so specifically focusing in our Kankakee manufacturing facility, also King of Prussia and Bern, Switzerland and Marburg, Germany. Um, I'm really excited today to share my insight and key learnings for this year. 
um, and really proud of the work that our team has done to transition to this virtual environment. Excellent, really appreciate that overview, everybody. And what I would love to do is have each of you just give us a real high level uh, understanding of how you engaged students in virtual events, uh, whether that be career fairs or other kinds of virtual events. Uh, and if you, uh, also just at a high level, what worked and what didn't. And of course, we'll dive much deeper into those topics as we go through the rest of the session today. Uh, so why don't we start with Etienne? Sure. So with respect to how we engaged students this year, um, the first thing we needed to do is look at when we knew we were making the transition to virtual and, and as we've progressed through that is assess our hiring needs and, and looking at the full slate of programming that we were intending on doing and then deciding what still makes sense to go forward with, what do we need to pare back, where do we need to adjust. And so um, it, I would say our engagement um, spanned from career fairs, which I'll admit we did a bit less of this upcoming season, and we can certainly dive into why. Um, we did a lot of partner, co-partnered events or co-sponsored events directly with partners, many of which were trusted diversity partners, as, as well as some institutions like IRC as an example. And so we, we focused on doing a bit more of the partnership uh, piece. And then we also, once we figured out all the technology and figured out, you know, how long should a summit be? Is it four hours, two hours, an hour and a half? Um, and all of those logistical details, we started to host our own targeted offerings as well. And so it was really a mix of all of that that really led to, to how we engage students. Um, and frankly, I would say, and this may be a theme that comes up is, you know, we found that in the virtual environment, one of the things we could do was be incredibly targeted, but then, but, but at the same time, reach a broader audience. And so we tried to take advantage of that as much as possible. Um, and that enabled us to invite a lot of students and engage a lot of students from universities where we may not have um, had a chance uh, in prior years to engage. So um, that's just sort of tip of the iceberg there in terms of what, what how we've engaged. In terms of what worked, um, I would say the targeted approach was really great for us, especially because one of the things that we went through this year as many firms was taking a you know headcount of 100% and bringing that down. So we had to adjust our hiring numbers a bit uh, down. So when we realized we weren't gonna be hiring as many people, the targeted approach really helped us to manage the flow and pipeline of applicants to manage against that. What I would say was a struggle is I would say two things. One was just working through the different iterations of technology, whether it be the, am I on Handshake, Simplicity, Brazen, which platform am I on at this point? Uh, and also getting through like the, what, what platform is Bloomberg willing to partner with and get associated with so that we can do the work that we're trying to do. And, and I'm sure we'll dive into Zoom fatigue as well, but that was a big thing, not only for our participants, but also for our recruitment team. Um, it's a lot of work, a lot more work, I think, than we all expected. Um, so I, that's just sort of a high level overview of, of where we are now. Perfect, really appreciate that. Uh, Jasmine. Absolutely, and I would say ditto to everything that Etienne said. Um, I think one of the benefits that we did, my team sat down at the beginning of the season, which I would say I remember a meeting on March 16th and really, you know, as our strategy kind of got flipped on its head, we, we kept um, two things at the top of our mind. So two mantras that I'd like to say, less is more. Um, so we focused more on marquee events. We decreased our career services, a uh, career, I'm sorry, fair presence um, and really focused on marquee events, but then also really from an empathetic perspective, we're looking to meet people where they were. So understanding that a lot of people had a changing environment and working home for the first, working from home for the first time, and also students, this was totally different. And so um, when we talk about Zoom gloom, how do we make sure that we are not reaching out to students to attend 20 events from CSL, but really marquee events? And so really proud of a series that we put together called Power Up Your Career Series. And it was really focused on professional development. So we partnered internally with our talent development team, um, to talk about personal branding, we hosted um, Stephanie Humphrey, who is a contributor on Good Morning America, to talk about building your virtual briefcase and, and your virtual footprint. Um, 
We focused on in EMEA on developing a student's guide to working from home. So all the things that they needed, lessening distractions, putting their space together, um, having writing notes and staying organized, but most importantly, um, taking breaks. And so we did a meditation series in EMEA um, and invited career services partner as well as faculty and students just recognizing that 2020 was just a year of change and I think if anything could happen, it will. Um, and so really our strategy was um, to really meet people where they were. Excellent, thanks for that overview. And of course, I have a thousand questions to ask each of you. So based upon your responses there, we're gonna dive much deeper uh, once we get quick overviews from both Lynn and Sue. So Lynn, I'm, but actually, yeah, Lynn. Okay, so we, similar to actually Jasmine and Etienne, from the very beginning, I think a couple of foundational things that were really important. One, our director sort of set the tone for us that we could try. We didn't have to have the burden of performance, but we could try and be open to being, um, to exploring and looking to see what we could do differently. So that's really important, I think, in terms of setting the tone for the team. The second thing that we did, we knew that everything was going to be virtual. So our employer team and our operations team vetted every single platform alive to figure out what was going to be <laughs> work best for us. And so, um, they could probably publish a book with that content, but that was also really important because we're try again trying to figure out what is going to be best for our students and our employers. And so those were all we didn't want to just pick a pick a platform and just because it was available to us. The third thing that is really important is that we also decided to continue in the vein of what we were doing was we offer our services in the career community model, right? So we have a couple of large events, but we also do a lot of very focused events. And so we looked at every event that we historically have done and we did the exercise of sort of keep sunset, sunset for now or sunset for later, reimagine, right? And we, and we thought about all of the events in terms of creating experiences for those connection points. And so to that end, we did transition some of our larger fairs and kept those. We kept some of the smaller fairs. And then we also leaned in a little bit more into some things like our job shadow programs or the an ag mentoring program that was in person, moved to virtual and grew, right? And so those were some of the success areas that we're seeing. And we'll be looking now at the data to figure out, okay, where do we go from here? Excellent, and Sue. Uh, so yeah, all my colleagues really have um, great things to say. And, and one thing um, that, you know, like Jasmine, we, we had a uh, previous to COVID, we had 14 industry specific uh, career fairs every year. And when COVID, you know, not, was knocking at our doorstep, um, we had already been investigating virtual career platforms for about six months before COVID um, knocked on our door. And so fortunately we were somewhat ready um, in making a decision on a, on a partner uh, for the virtual career fair. And in addition to career fairs, um, I'm in a department of student life and career development de de um, combined. And so we do a lot of programming for students and we really had to figure out how we were gonna virtually engage all of these students to do optional things. We know students don't really like to do optional and uh, reaching those students was critical. And so one thing that we did is, is we looked into something called behavioral informed messaging. And so we started um, specifically targeting our messages using behavioral informed messaging. So in behavioral informed messaging, if you're not familiar with it, really capitalizes on the insights from social and behavioral sciences. And it, it, you figure out what a specific behavior you want to have happen and then you write your messaging specific to that behavior. So it becomes very one, two, three. So it's, it's just very simple. And then you, you, you bring it together with maybe um, texts and robocalls. And uh, there's a really good study that was done by MDRC back in uh, 2015 that highlights behavioral informed messaging that we kind of um, focus this off of. And that really has helped us keep our messages really clean and really specific, specific for students. And so that's one thing that we've really been focusing on. How are we messaging to our students during this time? 
really helpful. And as we go through the rest of our session uh, today, uh, I, I would love for all of us to interact. So if you have questions for each other, feel free to, to, to jump in. Um, I'm going to go back to Etienne and some of the points he was making. I would love to just hear a little bit more about um, this idea of being targeted, but also the partner events that you're doing. So you start to do less career fairs, start to do more things on your own. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that, about the successes and why that strategy was working for you? Yeah, <clears throat> sure. So initially, one of the major drivers behind partnering with some of our partners was that one is depending on the partner's competency or area of expertise. So for example, we did part, we partnered and partnered consistently with management leader for, leadership for tomorrow. And one of the reasons we partner so directly with them is one of our fundamental principles and one of our major goals was continue uh, to increase the diversity of our entry level hiring. And so they have wonderful students and they have programs that said they know their students so well and they are able to complement the type of programming that we were able to put together, but host on their platform. And early on, this was April when we were slated to host them at Bloomberg for a full day. And we're March 13th, March 13th was my last day that Friday, whatever that Friday was. And we're sitting there and going, yeah, we're supposed to host MLT in the office in a few weeks. What are we going to do? And they quickly pivoted. We could quickly pivot, took a whole day um, and turned it into two hours. And what we learned was you got to pick and choose. You can't host everything all in one day. It's, well, what's the meat? Like, what is the point? What are you really trying to get across? And what we ultimately figured out we're trying to get across is company culture is always huge. How do we get people, as, and in the virtual environment, this becomes a really hot topic, right? How do we get people to understand what it's like to be in the office and to be with their fellow employees when you haven't been and you're being hired into an environment where you're not with those employees um, and those colleagues. Um, the other thing was, of course, is making sure that we do any sort of skill development that makes sense for those students. So in that particular case, we're focused really on building up finance skills or finance acumen, leveraging the Bloomberg terminal as a skill set. So that was really important, but then we had to figure out if you don't have access to the Bloomberg terminals in the office, how do we get you access remotely? How do we shift that programming? So it all came down to like, you're literally looking at hour by hour, line by line agenda item and going, how do we pivot? How do we go? But having a partner at the start really made us feel like, hey, we're not alone in this. We're actually working through this together. And similar to a call like this, you wind up learning so much in a short period of time as you work through it together. And so those relationships really carried us forward. And that helped us to decide, you know, how are we going to do these things when we decide to do them on our own? And a lot of that is the, a lot of that is because we had certain target markets that we wanted to attract for the types of roles that we had. So for example, we hire uh, students with a bit more technical proficiency on Python into our global data program, which is more of a market data analyst program. And so, if I want to attract those students, the question was, could I actually just create programming that really speaks to those students? And so we were able to do, right, a datathon. And we sponsored that datathon, and then it's the targeted but expanded. So I'm looking for this student type. I'd like to do this thing. But you know what? It doesn't just have to be from Rutgers, as an example. Rutgers is a great partner of ours, but maybe there are other schools that have similar majors, similar students who wanna participate, and now we can open that up. And that was really the biggest learning of that targeted but, but broad reach. Um, and hosting it on our own gives us some flexibility, but I have to say the partnerships continue to be a really great um, method in, uh, of engaging students for us still. Excellent, and similarly, Jasmine, um, you were taking a similar approach with this uh, broad but targeted, and so like broad events, targeted, and and, and I'd love to just um, pull on that a little bit. There have been several questions about your marquee events and doing those. So one of them is, did you do those before COVID, um, and was there a difference in the translation? And then second, then my next question is like, how did you find the audiences for those? And so just as Etienne was saying, like through partnership programs, he was working through some of his audiences. How did you target who the students were? Who was going to attend them? What, how did that work? 
Absolutely. And thank you for that question. So we did host marquee events prior to, but we went to lots of career fairs. And so I think a little bit to use Oprah's terminology, I had an aha moment. Our team said, oh my goodness, the geographic barriers have been broken with the utilization of technology. And so Whereas we may have flown to different schools, um, which we would consider to be um, some of our strategically aligned partners, the pandemic really gave us the opportunity to recruit from lots more schools. And I would even like to highlight just community colleges, something that we hadn't had as a part of our strategy before, but really looking at a two-year experience and how we could track those students, how we could continue to measure success, but then as an organization, help to continue to help them matriculate um, to a four-year institution. Um, our, our recruitment strategy is really looking at upskilling and, and skill development, but also the potential that students have. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, for some of our marquee events, it's really co-curation with our university partner. So um, I've been out of school for a, a while now. And so just making sure that I'm partnering with career services to get their insights on how students are adapting to the changing environment, but also we surveyed our students a lot. You know, are we doing the right thing in terms of programming? Um, I mentioned this before, but when you think about all the things that 2020 had to offer, we have a global pandemic, we have an election cycle, and we had racial unjust. So as an organization, we were listening to our partners to figure out, you know, how we would craft a great experience, one, to promote the organization as we served our patients, but two, what were people looking for during this time? And so one of the marquee events I can highlight um, was partnering with um, LGBTQAI organizations across the country uh, in the U.S. And as opposed to going to one school, we were looking for multiple chapters. Um, and how we could really highlight our employees. And we utilized Handshake, we utilized Microsoft Teams internally um, to bring students to us to really talk about topics that we were passionate about, but also to hear their insights. Excellent, thank you. That was really helpful. And Lynn, um, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, this, we're hearing a lot from Etienne and Jasmine about like these new modes of communicating with students and like the interactions. I, and I know you, you've also done some work to help students with preparing, right, uh, for those kinds of interactions. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So we have a couple of different ways that we support student development and preparation for, for the events and for the fairs. And so they range everything from having employers host uh, or facilitate those skill building sessions in preparation for the upcoming fair or the upcoming meetup. There's also a lot that's done via electronically via email. I was actually looking at data from our fairs in terms of when students say just about hearing from an event, the number one source for the number one and two is back from Handshake rather in email. So it's still email communication is the primary way that they're getting their messages and um, what they're responding to, right? And so that's a way in terms of the communication, but in terms of helping them scale up in our teams, also our career development team, they host the workshops and, and individuals to help them scale up and be ready for the fairs, especially when we're thinking about this, you know, the new virtual environment. So those are the, the different ways that we help connect and prepare. The other thing that's that we're doing even more in the, in the coming months and years is really increasing our tie and connection to educational outcomes. So to the events. So we're asking now, do you feel more, more confident connecting with employers after attending this event, right? So we're gonna be and using that data to help inform how we continue to develop our students. And so we're tying the events even more so to educational with educational outcomes to help us know how to prepare, help them prepare even and be stronger, strong candidates for employers. Love that. So, so important. And, and along with that, uh, Sue, you were talking about like your targeted messages. Um, and there's a lot of interest about that. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you've, you've had any um, measurable results from that, or are there any anecdotes that you might be able to provide for us or success stories? Um, you know, and, and it's interesting to hear Lynn say most of um, the students hear through email, 
you know, we're, we're in Delaware, um, where with our October 8th virtual career fair, 92% um, of our attendees cited that they heard from a faculty or staff member on campus. And so um, it, it just really drives home the relationships and how important those are to build with our faculty members and how critical they are because they have a, a great deal of influence over our students. And so as far as any anecdotal evidence, you know, regarding our, our targeted marketing, um, we've been doing a lot of incentivizing for our students. And so when we do our um, behavioral informed messaging, it includes really one of the most important things we need for our technical college students to do is get their resume ready. They're only with us for four semesters. So we need to get rocking and rolling on those resumes. And so we did a very targeted outreach with behavioral informed messaging around um, meeting with our um, career staff to work on resumes. And then within that targeted messaging was a, if you come work on it the month of let's say it was uh, September, you'll get a $25 gift card. And so really incentivizing the students um, to do what we know is good for them is, is helpful. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, Len, go ahead. One more thing. I, so Sue, you are spot on with the faculty piece. I do want to share, it was one, two, and three, handshake, email, faculty. So, so yeah, so those three were the top because those are the most important in terms of communication. So I completely agree with you. Yeah, and so like today, I just sent out an email to faculty talking about our February 4th career fair, right, because I want to catch them before they go on break. I sent them all the marketing assets that they could place into their D2L class shells, and I asked them, will you give credit for students who attend the fair? And um, at our school, you know, being a technical college, I would say the majority of our students are employed within their fields already. So we hear a lot of my, all my students are working. Well, that may be. However, we still as an institution need to prepare them with the skills to move on after here. And if they want to uh, change jobs, if they lose their job, they need to have the skills to be able to search. And so um, I just really drive that home with faculty that even though they're working, these are skills that, you know, I almost feel like a parent before I send you out into the world. These are, these are the skills you need to have. Excellent. I'm wondering, one of the points that's kind of been made by our employers is this idea of holding events that aren't necessarily connected directly to the universities or the college. So I'm hosting these events on my own. I'm not going to as many career fairs. Uh, and so I, I just want to pull on that thread a, a little bit more and get some perspective from each of you around that employer college tie, the career center and the employer and where you see this evolving to um, based upon what we experienced this fall, uh, particularly as it relates to events and the connection back to students. Um, it, who would like to start? Um, yeah, Tatiana, I, I, like, I'd yeah. love. Yeah, I, I. So, so Jasmine mentioned this earlier, and, and it's funny because this, these are not. I think what's what's, and I'm 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 loving this. I'm I'm seeing the chat. It's it's all great. I, I mean, these are not absolutes. So I think when we are saying, you know, we took a more targeted approach, we're still engaging students, and we still worked with a lot of our, and I say partners, not only diversity partners but also universities, right? It's not that that partnership is going to go away. I think what started to what, and I'll just say from my perspective, what we struggled with was losing the personal connection and finding out what are ways to recreate that. And so a career fair, I'll tell you, career fair, the booth, it's fine. I loved engaging with the students, like that one-to-one, -one, that connection, someone giving you their resume and, and being able to interact, say, yeah, this person, I feel that from them. So then the virtual career for, I think one of the major observations was, I'm not so sure we're getting the same now from that. And it, it was more of a question mark, right? Are we getting the same? So then that led us to that pivot of like, maybe we could create more of that intimate one-to-one -one if we're hosting something that's, again, a little bit smaller, or even the, the larger marquee can still do that, depending, of course, on how you're engaging. But like, from my perspective, the universities 
and that relationship with the professors, with career services, that will always play such a huge role because fundamentally, it's so fun. I'm seeing the, is it email? Is it faculty? Is it, this is about trust, right? You know, this is about who does the student trust? The student trust that the employer has credibility when they read that email? Does it, do they trust when the faculty member says, this is something that's right for you? That's a relationship there as well. I think that is always gonna be critical to our success. So I don't see my team, our strategy moving far away from universities at all. Like I, I think it's about, if we get back to a point where career fairs are back in play and we get that intimate connection, I'd love to be back on campus. My, my recruiters would love to be back on campus because that's just the way you build relationships. And I know that that relationship building, while it can still be done in this environment, there's something to be said for the types of relationships that can be built when you can be on campus. And so I, I envision that continuing to be a fundamental part of our strategy, always. And so Jasmine, would love to hear your take and I'm gonna go to Sue and Lynn for some responses from the university side to see what they're seeing, uh, as well as what they would like to do going forward based upon, upon these comments. Awesome. Happy to do so. Um, so what I would say, and I, I agree with Etienne, it's not um, it's not um, either or, it's both and all strategies. And so I can share a couple of examples. I talked a little bit about co-curation. And so I think light bulb moment that's going off for us is a huge opportunity to really look at curriculum integration with organizations. CSL, you know, we had, you know, a lot of brand recognition ahead of us because we had not had a, a developed UR strategy for the past couple of years. And so um, shout out to Kelly Hart at Temple University if she's on this call, but she gave us a great idea um, as we looked at like, okay, students are being approached by so many different employers virtually. They're trying to manage all of their, and, and Len used this example yesterday, but a certain synchronous courses or in-person dependent upon where you are located in the country. Um, so we're doing an event next semester on resilience. So for students who are finding this very challenging, we are going to have a panel of CSL employees that have graduated in 2001 during 9-11. 2008 during the financial crisis and now 2020 during a global pandemic just to give students one um, an outlook on the changing environment skills to be successful but this is all in partnership with the university and our hope is to use technology to enhance that um, for community colleges I saw in the comments um, with handshake they don't cover community colleges but if you give them a list of schools they can add them to your profile which has been really helpful for us as we are recruiting phlebotomists and technicians to work in our plasma centers all across the country. And so I think as this strategy is evolving, I do wanna just share how important our career services professionals are. And, um, and really they have the ability to talk directly to the students and give us insight to develop our strategies, but it's, it's all data driven. And I think this past semester will give us a great opportunity to look at our po and have postmortem discussions to figure out how we're going to move forward for the spring semester. Excellent. All right. So I'd love to hear responses from Sue and Lynn. Lynn, it looks like you're ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I have a comment and a question actually for, yeah. <laughs> for Jasmine and Etienne. So awesome. um, I think I agree with the approach. It's both ends. I, I do think there's still going to be some level of physical interaction in in the future. I, I think a hybrid, some type of hybrid approach um, is, is what we, I think we can anticipate. Uh, we're still in the business of relationship. And sometimes that works virtually and sometimes that, you know, it's in person. And I think you maybe the geographical back barriers come back up, but I think now that people will be even more comfortable, I think with the virtual aspect and we can lean, it, lean into that more. Um, I do have a question. Well, the other thing that I was that was interesting to me when I think about, I'm going to be, be very specific to fairs and meetups. So historically, most of our career centers, we, we report, oh, we've had X amount of students attend the fair, right? And that was kind of the measurement and that's the, the goal. And I don't want to say the goal, but that's the, the number that, that stands out or that we even report sometimes. Now with the platforms that we have, we're able to really talk about the connections. Mm 
And so to be able to say there were 2,000 students that came to the fair versus there were 5,000 students that engaged with the recruiter in person is a more is a is a very compelling story that now we'll be able to to, to talk about. And so I think we're going to be able to 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 take advantage of that as well. And I think we'll use that information as we talk with the employers, right? And then they're going to still want to you know, play to their strengths, right? So I think we wanna support that as well. My question is for um, Jasmine and Etienne, now that you've seen what you can do without the same recruiting budget, from a budget, <laughs> budgetary perspective, I know ideally we will wanna go back, but do you see it, do you see any impact of that? Like, do you see now that you've been able to do a lot more with Maybe technically, yet yeah, the less. What 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 factors does that do that do that does that play? I I can start off by that. So I don't see our budget decreasing. I think that the technologies that we'll use to reach candidates will change. And so we've been presented this year with so many different platforms. And also, um, I did want to just I saw in the chat utilization of social media, how do we use Instagram or iHeartRadio ads or Facebook and LinkedIn has been a tremendous platform for my team um, that we've utilized, but I see us looking at um, kind of a different strategic approach when we're reaching people all across our regions, which has really been helpful. I can share that next semester, my team, we use a tagline for spring, we're going global. We are implementing a plasma donor ambassador program that was pitched to us from our interns this summer to increase our plasma donorship, which is normally in locations in, in specific areas across the, the world, but we're gonna have students to do that. And so our budget would be shifted in some ways to that, but then also a global case study competition. So remember the aha moment that I mentioned, we are being able to, we're able to target different people now um, in addition to our current partners. So I don't see us you know, turning off the faucet for specific universities. We'll still have regional approaches to things, but it's given us a way to look at our strategy differently. Excellent. Um, Sue, you've been listening to all this. What response and reaction do you have to, to what you've heard? Oh, I actually am gonna back up um, yeah. quite a bit if, if I could. So there's a lot of uh, chat going on in the, in the chat about um, handshake not servicing community colleges. And then someone from Wisconsin, I think Sue, uh, another Sue, of course, uh, chimed in. And so Handshake actually has um, has developed a whole business plan around two-year colleges. And so um, they have the whole entire state of Wisconsin technical college system. And I know that um, I'm talking with them as well as a two-year college. And so they are making an effort to move into the two-year space, which I think is really good news for employers. Um, and it's good news for students because that really opens up some access issues um, that, you know, the Jasmine was explaining how, how they need the phlebotomists and TMAs and, and some different types of folks from two-year colleges. So this will really um, create more access for students, which is, is, which is exciting because Handshake is, you know, the big boy on the block. So i um, excited about that. And then um, a little bit about um, virtual events in general and partnering with employers. Um, one thing that we're doing is we're partnering with an organization in Minneapolis called Trades Hub. And um, we are doing live uh, tours of like a machining shop. And then we're bringing in our instructors. And so it, it's kind of this um, allowing uh, whether it's a high school student or someone who's looking to change careers or retool to, to safely, um, without leaving their home, be able to experience what it might be like in these other environments. So that, that's been fairly successful and we're enjoying doing that. Um, and then just one other thing I really wanna touch on is when we talk about industry and we talk about colleges, perhaps doing different things, um, one thing that I'm focusing on is really talking to business and industry about how we can continue to partner and try and focus on one platform, whatever that's going to be, because I would hate to see industry move over to a whole suite of platforms and then our students have to, every time they go to a different employer, have to figure out a platform because that's a barrier. 
And every time they go to the college, you have to figure out another platform. That's another barrier. And so really working with your local, um, your local business community to decide how you're going to do this as partners, right? Because we need them and they need us. And so really having those conversations, I think is very important. Absolutely. And another theme that keeps coming out of this, um, I'm hearing it in different ways, is this, this question and issue of partnership. And uh, Lynn, I know uh, for you, you've also done some partnerships across universities um, because you've found this to be an important. So just like the employers are kind of doing sometimes multi-employer or doing partnership kinds of, of programming on their own. Can you tell us a little bit about the strategy that you've em employed at Delaware? So um, you're referring to sort of uh, like development alumni relations and, and internal campus departments, correct? Yeah, as well as those that okay. you've done with other with other universities. Oh, okay, exactly. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah so, yeah. okay, so two things. Um, there was several. Can I go? But someone asked a question that I wanted to to sure qu answer quickly, asking about student participation, employer hosted events, and we're still trying to understand what that looks like. We can because in Handshake, it is a challenge sometimes if we're not hosting the event to be able to to dig in to see that a student attend if they signed up. And so there's still questions around in, in terms of what we're doing and seeing in that space. We're definitely seeing the events that we host with employers, uh, attendance, a, a decent amount of attendance there. So to, to answer your, your other question, one of the things, and we talked about this yesterday, that I think we see some opportunity is partnering with other institutions to co-host events. So we hosted and we partnered with uh, GW, Penn, uh, University of Pennsylvania and NYU. Last year, it was an in-person fair. This year, it made sense to transition it to virtual. Um, and with that transition, we were the number of employers increased, the number of student participation increased for us, right? Because for us, they are again with those geographical barriers and even sometimes with the time time scale barrier that our students were able to get access to employers that wouldn't necessarily be connected with us based upon whatever bar barrier that exists. And so by partnering with these other institutions, we're then able to scale opportunity and access with our students. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for institutions to lean into that space a little bit um, in, in terms of creating those experiences and connection points for students, given that the geographic barriers have come down. <laughs> So. Excellent, thanks for that perspective. And that leads me to one of your earlier points around measurement. And I'd like to turn it back to, to uh, Etienne and Jasmine to, you know, I, you know, to Lynn's point, I think she's also talking about economies of scale, right? Is what she was, she was really getting at because what we're finding is, is that with men, what our universities are reporting, colleges are reporting is that there's a pretty steep drop off from those students who actually say that they're gonna attend, but who actually attend, it's more like 30, 40%, maybe 50% actually show up. Um, but I know I've also heard from some employees, hey, that's okay, like don't, don't. I mean, the drop off isn't the issue. The issue is, is what's happening with the connection with me. Um, but I'm wondering what that measurement looks like for you, like what's worth it for you uh, in terms of your efforts and how are you, how are you pushing forward the measurement on those events? Sure, so, so you're absolutely right that I think, especially this year, we're much less interested in that number being 50, 60, 70% uh, in, in realizing that there will be significant drop off. I mean, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say I'm dropping off a bunch of the, you know, I go and I say, all these events sound really great. I can't wait to be educated, you know, in this new field. And then I realize I actually have a job. And then I look at my week and I go, I can't attend all these things. Mm -hmm. I have to imagine it's very similar for the students. So there's, there's a sense of empathy that def, definitely that in this world where there's a heightened sense of, oh, now you're really accessible. So let's throw more stuff out there that it's impossible that students are going to be able to commit to everything that's out there. What we are looking at, though, is some of it is not numbers based. Some of it is the engagement in the event itself. Are students speaking up? Are they asking good questions? Do they want to follow up with us to have more in-depth conversations? 
Do they, you know, and we've tried the survey approach in some instances too, to determine the value of the event to them, if it's a skill building workshop or something of that nature. Um, and then of course, we are gonna continue to look at applicants and hires and those types of things. But I, I've been shadowing even more of the events than I've done historically as well. And naturally that's because I'm, I don't have to travel to several different states all at once when my team is out there. So I get to see a bit more. And I can tell when a student is all about the event, is engaged, they're asking questions. I can see that and I can tell, you know, this is resonating a bit more. Now I can't be at everything. And so we still have some of those indicators in place. But I have to say, it's definitely more of a mix now than ever before between that anecdotal feel of, did we get this right and make this connection? It built on the follow-ups. And some of that, of course, did we see any applications? Did we see any, did we, did we think, hopefully hire some of those individuals as well? Excellent. And Jasmine, can I just ask, I want to put a nuance onto it when you answer, because I know a passion of yours is diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And so there are a number of questions that have been coming through around this kind of targeted approach and these events that perhaps it's not really reaching um, a diverse group. And so if I might be able to just layer that on to the, your, your response to this around metrics and, and taking a look at the success of events and kind of your, your, your perspective uh, with the diversity lens. Absolutely. And the best way I can do that is to give examples. I'll just talk about tracking metrics at first. So we're looking right now at the number of signups within our talent community, because as you all mentioned, there's a high level of attrition for virtual events. I can tell you, I personally have a folder, which is like learning. And I put a lot of invites in. And I think there's also a gift in being able to record sessions that students and professionals are able to go back and look at them. We also are surveying students. Um, and so at the end of our events, we're asking them their insights, what topics they'd like to hear about in the future, and we're asking them to rate us. And so we're making sure that we're doing the right sort of sessions. Um, one that we did this summer was to do, to track the patient journey. So we had a college student who's on our biotherapeutics to talk about their experience going through the pandemic and having to transition from in-person school to being at home, but also um, being on our therapies. Um, as DEI is related, an event, so going back to our marquee approach, we are going to have a, a diversity summit in the spring, a virtual diversity summit where we're partnering with the National Urban League and some of its affiliates, the Links Incorporated, and some of our strategic diversity partners and inviting all of the schools will post it on Handshake, but really that will give us access. And so I think um, I saw a comment in the chat about, and I'll speak to HBCUs specifically, this has given us an opportunity to partner with not just HBCUs, but also PWIs and student organizations uh, within those schools, as opposed to saying, I'm gonna go to these 10 HBCUs um, I did just want to highlight just technology has allowed us to go to many more schools um, to meet more students. And then one thing that our team has done is to host office hours. So if you looked at my LinkedIn maybe three weeks ago, you would see that my entire team was doing resume reviews. Um, so we didn't have the ability to go to campus, but we said, okay, CSL recruiters on this day for six hours, we're reviewing resumes for 30 minute time blocks. And that was my entire team, including myself. So we're just all trying to come up with strategic ways, but getting insights from career services departments, but most importantly for me, students. That's who I listen to most of the time. Excellent. And uh, Sue, I'm just wondering um, what feedback you have related to these issues as well. To be perfectly honest with you, I was typing in the chat, so I was half listening to Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I well, I know that you your your population, particularly um, with such a large uh, uh, marginalized community, right. uh, as part of your population, if you're seeing differences in terms of engagement and how you might be measuring that. You know, um, engagement in general has been extremely difficult. Um, our students are tired, our students are hurting, our students are lonely. Um, you have a situation where 
uh, you know, the pandemic came and um, students are, are working very, very hard. 45% uh, of our students at Hennepin Tech either experienced housing or food insecurity on a regular basis. And so um, we're really in that, that Maslow's hierarchy of need, basic needs type situation, right? And so being able to connect with students and really help them find the services they need. So we have the pandemic and then we have um, the murder of George Floyd on our, in our back, backyard. And we have, um, we have students who have children who they're trying to help homeschool. We have technology issues. We have people without Wi-Fi. We have people without the appropriate spaces to even attend a career fair. And so you look at all these barriers and as we, we identify each barrier, it's up to the college to really think, how are we, how are we here for students? Right? How are we showing up for students? Not are the students college ready, but is this college student ready? And so, um, you know, one access piece in particular that we learned with our first virtual career fair is that uh, a number of students didn't attend because they didn't have the correct technology or they didn't have the correct space in which to attend the fair. So for this next fair, um, we are designating a specific lab, you know, and we're doing all the COVID uh, social distancing, et cetera. And that lab will be open during the whole career fair and a career person team will, will be there um, to assist that student in getting logged in and, and preparing for that fair. And so really trying to find these barriers because students don't necessarily come to us until the, it is full-blown crisis, right? So if we can work upstream to identify those things on the front end, we're, we're going to um, have a lot more successful students who retain and finish. And so that, that's our focus. Excellent, such great suggestions and ideas. Um, uh, John, for I... us to think through and react to, yeah. If I can, I just, I want to like co-sign with your point, Sue, I think it's so important and that's, and I'm not sure if I articulated it clearly, but just meeting people where they are. And I think it's important as employers that we are um, respecting that. I heard from a lot of students that this semester has been so stressful. Um, it's hard in the virtual platforms because they are having to transition to several, whether it be a national conference or at the respective schools. So thank you for saying that because one of the things that has been top of mind for me is that all students don't have a safe space to be in. They are, you know, some, some have challenges, but then also um, it's just a very challenging time from a mental health perspective. So I thank you for saying that. Excellent. And uh, uh, Pass, we only have a couple minutes left. So I'd like to just uh, do maybe one quick round, Robin, quick response. And that's for each of you to just maybe say what you're looking forward to the most in 2021. Uh, so I'll give you just like a second there to think about that. And uh, why don't we start with Etienne? Oh man, you know, the first word that came to mind was clarity. I don't think I'm gonna get it, but we'll get close to it. <laughs> awesome. Lynn. Oh, you're muted, Lynn. I, of course, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm looking forward to, um, with our team and our community, celebrating the small wins along the way, right? And then also, I think there's still a lot of time to be very curious. There's a lot, we now have more data, we have more information. So I think it's a, a great time to be curious and, and see what, what we can innovate and create and adjust as going forward. Awesome. Sue? I cannot wait to reconnect with my students in person. I've been getting texts, we miss you. And I'm like, I miss you guys too. <laughs> so reconnecting with students in person, I, I am holding out that 2021 is going to allow that at some point. Awesome, Jasmine. I wrote this down, so I'll say with one click, I can meet leaders, game changers, rock star, and future talents, but I really miss seeing people in person. Excellent. Well, thank you all for being here today. You've been great panelists. I've learned a lot. Hopefully everyone listening has learned a lot. I uh, really want to thank our sponsor from Premier Virtual, Steve, for, for uh, getting us through today's session. Um, 
And I want to wish everybody uh, a happy holiday season and looking forward to bringing in uh, a great new year this next year. Hopefully it'll be much brighter, much happier and much healthier. Uh, and uh, look forward to interacting with you uh, over the course of this next year as well. And with that, I think that's the end of our session. Awesome.